Hello and welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. Do you have a cluster king or queen in your family? No, I'm not talking about the ones who make it harder for you to do research. I'm talking about those who have shown up in your life that are related to your ancestors via you know, relatives or whether or not they are associates of your ancestors and just really broke open your genealogy for you. Well, today we're going to show you, if you don't have one, we're going to show you how to find out who your cluster king or queen are. And we have a special guest to help us with that. Her name is Robin Smith of Reclaiming Kin, and she's going to talk to us about um, using cluster research for your ancestry. We've had cluster talks before, but it ne it's, there's never enough cluster talks because each one will provide you with different things. Also, Jim and Michael, they never, ever let us down. They have, they're squeezing estate pet packets again. I don't know if you've ever gotten an estate packet for your ancestor, but there's so much. I got one. It's over a hundred pages. So Michael and Jim today, they have another way to get clues out of pack, um, pension, oh, excuse me, out of estate packets. And they're calling it paid in full. Your ancestors' bills are clues. So welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. We are available on YouTube, on Facebook, and of course, our home is Philly Cam. And so let us know if you're here live or watching and recording where you are. And of course, share your genealogy group because you never know when there's a genealogy soul out there that needs saving. So who's your cluster king or queen? I'm going to share mine. Let's go see. I'm not going to call them cluster kings. Let's go check out and see if Michael and Jim have a cluster king or queen in their family. So let's bring them all out. Excuse me. First, columnist and editor, Jim Beidler. How are you today, Jim? Doing well. Doing well. Next up, we have genealogy tip of the day and i like to say a hundred clicks a, a thousand clicks a day mr <laughs> michael john neal <laughs> how are you guys i'm doing i'm doing is it fine or good or well i'm happy we'll just put it happy there we go i never did get those straight i never got that well lesson that was a hard <laughs> one <laughs> you have to dig deep to get the well lesson yeah <laughs> so I'm going to share what my cluster king is, and his name is Ephraim Atkins, and he was my great-grandmother's brother. And if it was not for him opening up a bank account with the Freedmen's Bank, we might still be looking for who the enslaver was for that side of the family. So he is my cluster king indeed. Do you guys have a cluster king or queen that you'd like to? Oh, and I got to say his name, Ephraim Atkins. Thank you, Ephraim Atkins. So do you guys have a cluster king or queen? I, I can think of several. The one I'm going to mention is keeping in line with the E names. My <laughs> uh, second great grandfather's sister, Emmer, E-M-M-A-R, not Emma, E-M-M-A-R. Um, if she hadn't married as her fifth or sixth or seventh husband it depends on how you count but uh, there was a civil war veteran her pension that she got after he died documented her parents and siblings uh, of people in a family where there are no contemporary records without going into all that detail so if she hadn't had that record the relationships i would not have been able to document in any really good way so she's one of my uh, people and what's her name again Emmer was her Emmer Sargent. I'm not going to go through all her married names. Olson Emmer Sargent. Name. Say her Emmer. name. Emmer all right. R, because there's an affidavit about her name and her pension. It was Emmer. Emmer. With an Emmer. R. All right, Jim. You have a, a cluster king or queen? Well, I'm going to go with the E on the last name. <laughs> an ancestor, Jacob Etchberger. 
actually several i have several jacob etchbergers in my in my lineage and uh they were in the early tulpahawken area of berks county um and uh stayed there stayed there forever and therefore were in a lot of the records married into a lot of the prominent families even mm. they though they weren't real prominent themselves but hey they were upwardly mobile there you go. <laughs> that's about right yeah nothing wrong with that all right guys you guys are hanging out in one of my favorite record groups estate records and today you have a quick start that you are calling paid in full your ancestors bills are clues so do you want to talk about that a little bit or you want to just get going we can just get going and we'll uh, get to the I'll say let's first we say where the... do you um because I don't think we discuss how do you get estate records? How do you get estate packets for your these, these are going to be local court records in most places in the United States. Um, and we're looking at the records of settling the estate. But in our discussion today, we're going to be focused on what bills were paid by your ancestors, executor or administrators, and how you can use what those bills were for and to whom they were paid to to broaden that your research you may find i've already forgotten what word chanel had your collateral kin to help you with things when you search through these people but you may get some more social uh, social history as well which sometimes we, we have a need for want to find out and these bills can also give us some of that too all right so let's go ahead and get started with step one of paid in full i want everybody said it about me paid in full your ancestors bills are your clues so step one is pick a list of bills paid by the ancestors estate so um okay um did you want to talk about that a little bit well ba basically we're, when you're looking at a probate you're hoping to find a probate that lists the bills. sometimes they don't always list them in as much detail as we would like uh, it kind of depends upon the time period and the location but for the purposes of our discussion you're not we're not talking about the list of heirs or the list of assets or things of that type we're looking at what money was paid out from your ancestors estate and to whom it was paid out and hopefully find out a little bit why it was paid out if if possible okay you so out of all the bills, pages uh-huh you, you may get the paper bills there may be paper bills submitted all you might see is just a listing of dates amounts and to whom it was paid out it depends on the time period and the place an absolute worst case scenario is there there won't be any bills at all it'll just be an aggregate in the accounting uh, of the estate uh the total number total uh, dollar amount of the bills uh, but we can we can hope for the best case scenario that like michael says there that are those papers and uh, with a lot of names and amounts the ultimate worst case scenario is there are no bills and i've seen a few where that's the they they wrapped everything up before they died and there were no you know usually there's some but once in a blue moon you might not find any it's unusual that it happens or or maybe there are no bills that were paid and you as a descendant may be the one who is on the on the hook for those oh no so but wouldn't they list creditors as well in within they should they should list creditors and if their claims were denied it should say that normally without going into the whole lecture about state statute state statute normally for these cases claims against an estate are put in one of several categories um, the higher the category the more likely it is to be paid in full depending upon the funds typically things to widows and children are higher claims and the creditors are several steps down depending upon whether it was secured unsecured and all, all kinds of things like that. oh so it's not a first in first out thing you know you it's got not a, first. It's, no it's not turn your bills in first to get paid first that is not how this works <laughs> <laughs> good all try right. though but that's not how it works <laughs> and okay all right so you're going to pick a list of bills paid and that's probably why sometimes the packets are so thick because there's so many of those slips in there um yeah so many all right so that's step one you pick a set of bills to kind of study like 
for analysis part one. Step two is then to pull out names of individuals, companies, and unknown items. So you want to give an example of unknown items? Um, for me with the unknown items, usually it's a piece of farm equipment that I don't remember what it, <laughs> what it was. I mean, if it's something from 1850 or 1860, I might not be familiar. I'm not going to be familiar with it. It might be it. They might use a name I'm not familiar with. If it's an ancestor who had an occupation I'm not familiar with at all, there may be a lot of items in there. I don't know what they are. So one of the things I suggest people do, in addition to the first two things, which are kind of, I hate to say common sense, but pretty close, is to anything they don't understand what it is, find out, you know, like I have one who ha she had a, we mentioned this in the show prep, she had a galvanic battery in 1860 <laughs> and i thought she had that for her model t prototype <laughs> um, obviously she didn't and i googled it and it was a health quackery item they ah. so you know there are things like that just you get some social history from those you might get some other clues from those as well when you figure them out and i okay. still say that your 4-h training michael should have included farm Im implements from the 1850s but exactly what kind of learning <laughs> it unfortunately it did not <laughs> <laughs> all right so you're pulling out what we're used to names companies and anything unknown and so then step three is to research these individuals companies and unknown items um any special research places for those besides you know a search a google search well, i mean this is like this is like doing parallel research which is what what you do a lot of times with a fan club uh friends associates and neighbors where you're researching them just as hot and heavy as you do your actual ancestors uh and using you know, just all of the basic records from uh, census to tax list to church records to civil records, if they exist for that time period. Yeah, I, I just like to, to reiterate what Jim says about the individuals. If you need some place to start, I might start with the closest census to when the record was created, just to kind of give you a start. Google the company, maybe look in old newspapers. Which and old newspapers and Google also helps for the unknown items too. That's how I got a picture of the galvanic battery. From <laughs> there was a newspaper. It was a newspaper ad for it. That is hilarious. Now you want me make me want to go back and like I'm I'm that's what that's the point of it is to go back and really look closer at what you're looking at. I was just looking for enslaved people and I just pulled them out and I I ran right and so I probably need to go back and uh look again. So uh, you did your research. Step four is then to document your findings. Uh, step five is to share. Where did you document the galvanized battery, Michael? <laughs> did he hear me? I did not hear you if you were talking to me. Oh, I said, where did you where did you document the finding of the galvanized battery? I put that in. I put that in this individual's notes where I've got her commentary about her estate. So I'm, I also blogged about it a little bit. So if anybody else found it, and didn't know what it was, they, they they do a Google search. That post may or may not come up depending upon how Google works. Um, but some of these things, if you're looking for something to write about, if you need, if you want to write about your ancestors, just writing about some things you discover in their estate settlement can be uh, can give you some things to write about. The one you're showing right now comes from Coshocta County, Ohio in the 1820s. I've underlined the names. These are people, as we mentioned earlier, you're going to want to research them um, as fully as you can. Most of these are associates. There's, I think, maybe one or two in-laws here when you go through, when I went through the names that are listed in the estate settlement. One of the things that I thought was interesting, um, about halfway down, um, it says schooling. So apparently they were paying uh, to send the children to school. If you look about halfway down, you can see that on the right hand. I think it's number 127. 
um, on the list of things there for seven. Ah, I see schooling. it. Yeah. Matthew Evans account for and, schooling. Okay. Yeah. So that would, and so Matthew Evans is obviously the teacher. Um, then there's another one down there for clerking. There's uh, the, it mentions the vendu. I'm going to have to squeeze and look at that. Um, crying at the vendu. I don't know if you knew what crying, <laughs> you know what crying at the vendu means. That does not mean he was sobbing about something. Crying the <laughs> vendor the, was the auction. He was the auctioneer. Um, oh, wow. Crying at the vendor. Yeah, so okay. Mr. Trebway was, was the auctioneer. The gentleman after that clerked at the at the auction. And then at the very bottom in red. Whiskey. Uh, whiskey at the vendor. So, you know, that helps those prices go up a little bit to get them a little <laughs> bit liquored up. So they spent money on, on uh, I always thought that was so funny. Um, alcohol at the um, at the sale. Okay, let's see what do you guys have for us next. This is a close up. <laughs> this is a close up. Yeah, this is one from 1889. This is a list of what was due for uh, two bulky Satorius from her. That was actually her father. It doesn't say this. That relationship is not given in this document. So that's why you, you know, sometimes you'll know who these people are. Sometimes you won't. Um, but uh, Volke as guardian for these two children, basically what happened here, other documents in the file, which we're not going to show uh, just in the interest of time, they were grandchildren of the man who was deceased. And the grandchildren had stayed with the grandfather and helped him out. And after oh. he died, daughter Volke sued for their back wages, which a parent could do in 18. For when I first read this, I wasn't aware that a parent could do that in 1889. But at this point in time, um, they could do that. So one year wages due. Yeah. One year wages due. And there, there's some backstory here. Her husband had died, left her nearly destitute. So I really think she was just, you know, in her defense, trying to support the other children she had. And sure, was, sure. One way to help do that. And they paid, they, they did the work. They, they did the work. And so there, that's the amount those two, five months, I think, I forget the other ones, but that, that's the amount that they received. This one's a little bit later from 1924. And again, it's just got a list of items that were paid. There's in this uh, probate, there aren't the receipts. Don't ask me why. I don't know. There's just a list of the bills that were paid in the amount. But it mentions the, it's got it spelled wrong. It's the Wartburg Publishing Company. That's a Lutheran publishing company. So if I didn't know that an, um, they're buying things from this publishing company, um, what they were buying i don't know probably some little uh hymn book or prayer book or something or whatnot there is a newspaper subscription the one for four dollars and 25 cents or on august the 6th that's a newspaper called the Ostrich okay newspaper. yeah so this would have been the unknown for me and i would right. have had to look this one up yeah right and i mean for me that was a known. i knew what that newspaper was but if i again that's something if you're not aware of it you'd want to to look into that if she's subscribing to that newspaper, if we think just for a minute, chances are her obituary could be in that. That'd What's be a, a church subscription? Is that like tithes? You know, it kind of makes me wonder if that's what that Dinklage, this would be a really good time. I underline church subscription because that's what I initially had some question about what that was. But the, uh, the name to whom it is paid, I'm pretty yeah. sure that he was the pastor. So yeah. that's what that likely likely looks like there. Um, you know, Google was helpful on that because I didn't remember that the name didn't ring a bell to me. Right above that, it mentions the Good Shepherd Home. Yes, what's the Good Shepherd Home? I, you know, that's on my list of things to find out. The one yeah. thing in this area, um, even today, there's a nursing home. I'm pretty sure. It, for a time was called the Good Shepherd Home. It was not called that in 1924. She was not in the nursing home when she died. So I don't know, but that makes the point about not jumping to conclusions. Today, yeah. if I saw that in somebody from that area, I think it was a nursing home payment. Um, obviously it'd be a little more than $5.07. But at this point in time, I'm not sure. I'm gonna have, the, local newspapers are probably one good way to try to figure out what that is. It could also be that it's some church affiliated thing it could be in Cincinnati. It could be in 
wherever. I'm not going to find that just in the local papers. That's going to take a little digging around because if you look for Good Shepherd Home in the newspapers, you're going to find a lot of those. So yes, that I'm sure. Oh my gosh. Take a little bit. Um, you got a lot of work to do, Michael. You better you get away. You sure do. Oh, so Dewey asked, could these things be connected with the funeral services and burial? I see a couple in this one. She might have asked that before we showed this one, but digging um, up the grave. Yeah, the grave. Funeral the, services. There's another pastor who's, who's given the sermon. Um, the potatoes the are that, probably for the potato salad. <laughs> they probably are. Um, the ones I underlined, I kind of don't think they're related to the funeral, but I, I could be wrong. I'm just thinking there, there are things she had um, set up for her before she died, and they had to be they had to be paid. Um, but I could, right. be, I could be wrong. Well, an outside chance is that it could be publishing legal notices about the estate. Okay. That's true, too. That's bad. <laughs> All right. What's this one here? This one here is it's not it's not a, a, a direct line relative of mine, uh, but it comes from a state of a John Bidler. And um, this was the accounting for the sheriff's jury uh, that valued his real estate. And this is pretty common if they uh, did not either did not have a will or or if they had a will and uh, the real estate was going to have to be divided is that they impaneled what they call the sheriff's ju jury of 12 men. And uh, what typically happened is these 12 men went out to a tavern and decided how much is this real estate worth. And here we have even refreshments at the inquest. $2.25. <laughs> the seven jurors each got a buck. But the attorneys, don't the attorneys always, aren't they the ones that make out? They got 20 bucks. 20 out bucks. Yeah. Yeah. And then you see at the bottom there, or, or toward the bottom, uh, they came up with a valuation of $3,073.80. And then they deduct from that uh, the expenses. That's how that bill wow. is going to be paid is off of that valuation. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. Yep. Wow. There's some good stuff in estate records. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. You know, is there anything else that you guys wanted to share with estate records? Because I forgot to say hello to everybody. Jim, you're the one who's supposed to remind me of that. Well, you just rushed in. I couldn't <laughs> uh, couldn't stop you. But I, I just want to note that uh, Judy from Chicago, she was our, our first one aboard. Yes, Judy, Judy. Let's say hi to everyone since Jim reminded me. I remind we reminded each other. We are so happy to have you here today. Yes, Judy, Chicago land um, and Green County um, in Wisconsin Genealogical Society. Very nice. Hey, Melvin from Northern Virginia. M. Danley uh, Marie from PG County. I love saying PG County. Um, hey, Erwin from Delaware Augs. I see you guys are doing some great stuff over there. Hello, Katie and Philly. Um, thank you so much, guys, for being here. So let us run through these steps for this fun, uh, quick start. Did you guys have any questions for Jim and Michael about these estate records, about anything? And Michael and Jim, are there any other fun things that you found in your estate records before I, I do the run through? I do have an 1870 receipt from one in Iowa where it indicated how uh, details about the tombstone what type what type of material how tall how wide the inscription everything i've seen bills for paying for the tombstone you know that's a common thing to see in there but not a bill with a description of the tombstone in it and an indication of what's supposed to be the inscription on it that's nice that's really cool that's really cool the detail well Mm -hmm. And my my favorite estate file is of a woman named Kate Dobb in Lebanon, uh, where in her will, uh, she says she's uh, disinheriting her one daughter because she never tried to please me. 
she's <laughs> disinheriting her one son because she says, and she puts this in her will, I believe that he made an unsuccessful attempt to kill me years ago. <laughs> and then her final two children, she doesn't outright disinherit. She she says they'll they'll have the remainder of their of the estate, but they have to wait until some character named uh, Jerry Gamber uh, dies. Well, as it turns out, Jerry Gamber is her. <coughs> housekeeper oh. <laughs> um, and 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 as it tur- turns out he he lives long enough that that so and so to exhaust the estate so. get the heck out of here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> an unsuccessful attempt that is hilarious okay let's go through the steps for paid in full your ancestors' bills are your clues. Step one, pick a list of bills paid by the ancestors' estate. Step two, pull out names of individuals, companies, and non- unknown items. Step three, research the individuals, the companies, and the unknown items. And Michael said, of course, start with the records closest to the time of the uh, estate being probated. Step four is to document your findings. And of course, step five, you want to share in the blog. We all have blogs, right? Or Facebook. We can't have a blog. You got to have a Facebook page. You got to have some way to share and write these things up. So Jim and Michael, thank you very. Oops, hold on. Let's make sure there's no questions for you. Were there any questions for you? Judy said, hello. MK Clark is here. All right, guys. Thank you so much for uh, that quick start. Yeah. Talk See you to later. you later. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, guys. Give me one second to divide my show up. <laughs> All right. Welcome back for our special guest, um, Robin Smith. And I am going to, before we have her come out, I am going to share with you, hopefully it works correctly this time, a clip from First and Now. And this is where genealogists share what they, how they were when they were genealogy newbies and what they are like today. So hopefully you guys tell me if you can't hear the sound on this. What were they like when they began genealogy versus today? We ask in first and now. Meet Robin Smith, genealogist and author of The Best of Reclaiming Kin. What was your first genealogy software? My first genealogy software was Family Tree Maker. And what are you using now? The software I use now is Roots Magic. What was your first genealogy group? My first genealogy group was the DC Genealogical Society, which I'm not even sure if it exists anymore. And also AUGS, the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. Which group are you a member of now? Now I'm a member still of AUGS, but also of the Maryland Genealogical Society, the Tennessee Genealogical Society, the Alabama Historical uh, Genealogical Society, the Hardin County, Tennessee Genealogical Society, Montgomery County, Maryland Genealogical Society, and I'm sure there's one I'm missing, so quite a few. What was your first oral interview for genealogy? My first oral history interview was my maternal grandmother. And what was your last oral interview that you've done? The latest oral history interviews I've done were over Zoom uh, last year, and they were with my father's first cousins who were all in their 80s. So Zoom is perfect for doing those now. What was the first document you found? The first document that I can remember was the 1920 census where I saw my grandmother as a little girl um, because you never think of your grandparents as 
having the children themselves. And the last document you found? The last document I found that gave an impact was a 1912 newspaper ad that led to uncovering the identity of my third great grandmother. What was your first challenge? My first challenge was really just uh, getting to see census images because this was before there was an Ancestry.com that offered them. So going down to NARA and actually getting census images. I remember Heritage Quest sold the 1880 set by CD. That was really exciting, but just getting census images. And what's your challenge now? I am in the middle of a multi-year effort uh, right now to write up all of my research. And what was the first advice you received? It's kind of sad. I don't remember receiving any genealogy advice when I first started, I think because I was in groups with other new researchers. Uh, but I do remember the guidance that I got from some of the early books that I read, particularly Somerset Homecoming by Dorothy Redford. I read that in one sitting and that book really lit a fire under me. And what advice would you give to a movie? The advice I would give to a newbie is read, 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 read genealogy books and read case studies. Uh, nobody likes to hear that. They think it's boring, but it's going to help your research and it's going to help you learn the skills that you need to uncover the brick walls you have in your family. As you can see, Robin is a genealogy junkie. She could have probably gone on for like five more minutes about her genealogy groups. And actually, that's where we met at a genealogy group. So let's bring on our special guest for today, Robin Smith. Hello, Robin. How are you? Oops, I cannot hear you because I muted you. Hold on, let me unmute you. Okay, I can hear you now. How are you? Hello, hello, hello. I'm fine. That was a bit painful to watch, but other than that. Stop it. I'm not used to looking at myself on film. Know, it's hard. Get used to it, honey. Mm. You're going to be on film more. So, Robin, all of our special guests, we love to ask for them to share with us. You shared a lot. I learned a lot about you. You're like, oh my God, I could go on. But <laughs> We ask our special guest to share with us their one minute genealogy story, how you got started and how you knew you were hooked. So thanks. That's a great question. I alluded to it uh, in the video that you played, but it was the death of my maternal grandmother, uh, paternal grandmother in 1997. I was 27 years old. And it just hit me that I had one grandmother, grandparent living, and that I didn't know very much about my family. So there's something about her death um, that led me down to go to NARA and get out that dusty microfilm. And when I saw her as a little girl, I was hooked. hooked. I got to see my grandmom as a little child too um, in the census. That was my first record too. It blows your mind. You don't. It does. <laughs> You're just like, she used to be six? What? I, <laughs> what? Grandma? <laughs> it's just. It's mind blowing. It is. It is. So, Robin, you are bringing to us today, um, you know, a methodology that is tried and true. And we could see this methodology, the methodology used in so many different ways. And so I'm really thankful that you're here today to share yours. Me too. And so let's go ahead and get started with. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Using cluster My research for ancestry. So um, step one. Oh, so first tell us what is cluster research. So Shamel, if I looked in the records of your best friend, I would find lots of information about you. What? Right? You were you were right, you were with her through a lot of those things. And so cluster research, you know, takes advantage of the fact that human beings are social creatures. 
And so when we're at a brick wall with our ancestors, we, we all we need to do is pivot and look at the group of people that they lived among, played among, socialized among, moved with, and those give us another opportunity to uh, find more people in our tree. I love it. Okay, cluster, <laughs> not a Charlie Fox trot, but good cluster research. Okay, yes. let's start with step one is to hone your research skills. I love this as a step one. I think you're like the first one who did this. Why and how do you do this, Robin? So genealogy is just like anything else. If you think about your occupation, your job, you've got to practice, you've got to learn if you want to move up in the world of whatever it is you do for a living. So in genealogy, we can strengthen those muscles. We can actually uh, do some skill building. So we take uh, classes, we read our genealogical books, we go to institutes, we read blogs, hopefully you read mine. And those are the ways that we learn genealogy, skill building and hone our skills. And we can get better at this with a little bit of focus over time. Yes. Keep that education going. It, it continues. Like if you're really going to do this, it continues, right? In so many ways. We could Zoom all over the country now, right? Just drop in all these other genealogical groups and listen to them teach. So it's just, this is great. It's a wonderful thing. All right. So step two, after you get, you know, get your, get your foundation going, is to review your records for clues. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. What do you mean? So I like to say, take a source and actually take a document, a blank piece of paper, and see if you can do an analysis of that source. Just write down everything that you notice, right? I like to do those little, you know, in magazines when they have two pictures side by side and they look alike, and the, and the picture says, find the 20 differences. I do that because it hones my ability to notice small things. So, so things like that are, are, are ways that you can enhance that ability but you just have to practice it and over time you'll get better and the key is that you notice things that you wouldn't have noticed earlier when you were a young genealogist but things that you can notice now as a clue yes that's yes. your own little gauge internally for it exactly so go in and uh look at those records again i swear every time you look at it it's like something else has fallen out of it and you just mm -hmm. feel like Sometimes I feel inadequate, but it's like, why did you see this? But it's just part of nature, human nature. So I like to use myself as the as the guinea pig for teaching everyone else how to not make the mistake that I just made. Exactly. Exactly. That's why we make these mistakes so we can. Mm -hmm. teach them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Go step ahead. three is then to extract the cluster from the records. That sounds technical. Do you need gloves for this? How do you do No, ma'am. No, ma'am. So we're looking in census records. Who are they living with that you don't know? Um, if we look at a deed record, who did they buy land from? When they get married, who was the witness? Who are the bondsmen in their probate records, right? So as you're going through these records, you're, you're writing down all of the people that are in these records showing up associating with your ancestor. They're in the cluster. They're okay. in the cluster. And I just do it. I go through the records, go, you're in the cluster. You're in the cluster. Okay. All right. You cluster, cluster. You are in the cluster. And <laughs> you're in the cluster. I have you to cluster. get like Oprah, but I put them in the I put them in the cluster. <laughs> and they might lead me somewhere exciting. That's what I'm okay. hoping. Okay. So step four is then to research the cluster. <laughs> And so would you like to share some documents now? Sure. Robin has a mountain of documents, y'all. So put on your seatbelt. I am not known for being pithy, but I'm going to try my best because we are time limited here. <laughs> I can right. talk all day. I'm going to try. All right. Let me. Um, I don't know so you're going to research everyone in your cluster as if you already knew that they were your relative. That's how you're researching them. Okay. So this started with my ancestor, Mike Fendrick, who lived in Tennessee. And this is where he married and raised eight children. And as you can see, his, his death certificate gave me no love. 
My goal was to discover who his <laughs> That's a sad. Yeah. I didn't mean to do that. I just took it off because, you know, don't even make us sad like that. I I'm, just, you know, come on. You, we've seen these, right? We get a lot of these. Okay, next slide. Usually they, they say unknown in some cursive script that you can't figure out. And you're like, what's that name? You're like, mm -hmm. unknown. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. Do you remember back in the early days where people thought DR was a person? They go, someone oh named God. DR. <laughs> and then you realize it's don't know. So every single census in Tennessee, except one that he appeared in, said that he was born in Alabama. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to notice here on the 1900 census, he said that his father was born in Washington, D.C. So that is, a, it is an important clue and a detail that I noticed that's really going to become useful uh, in just a little bit. Okay, okay next. So now I know he's from Alabama and the problem is I don't know where in Alabama. I can't just jump into the state of Alabama. Yeah. So now I'm going to do a classic cluster strategy and go through his children. So I'm going to see how many of his the children have death certificates and I have one for his daughter here. And it actually asserted that her father was born in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Oh. Tuscumbia. And this was the only death certificate that gave me uh, an, an actual place. So next slide. I know, Shamel, you love Matt. Uh, oh, oh, I, I had a map in there because um, I wanted you to see that it was. We, have, we do have a map, but it's not it's not here. We'll see. Okay. It in a second. We'll see it. We'll see it. So. I'm not going to go into Alabama just yet, but I also noticed in 1920 that my ancestor Mike was boarding in someone's house whose name was D. Suggs. And I noticed that D and his wife were also from Alabama. And not just that, my ancestor Mike served as bondsman in D's, in D's marriage, and they also signed a sharecropping agreement together. So there, there are those multiple associations. So now I'm going to get curious about D and I'm going to follow him back and see where it leads me. I'm going to research D sucks. Okay. See what I can find out about D sucks. And so here you can see the marriage record of D and my ancestor, Mike, as the bondsman. Uh -huh. Good stuff. And of course, we would notice at the bottom that Mike this select, suggests that he's illiterate, right? He signs with his mark and not by his name. Mm -hmm. In the next uh, slide, this one is showing their share. It was a sharecropping agreement that Mike Fendrick, his first name was John, actually, and D. Suggs. And so mm -hmm. they are actually participating they are jointly working a crop together so now i'm really i'm really interested in d yeah I'm really who is this guy let me see what i can find who is d suggs so i start tracing d suggs back in the census and in 18, 18 80, he lands me in lawrence county alabama which is uh, one county over from where Tuscumbia was. I want you to notice that he's living with a woman named Selena Brooks. And put a pin in that because that's going to come back uh, in just a little bit. Okay. Next slide. Selena, Selena okay. Brooks. He's laboring in her household. Okay. Okay. He sucks. What we got? Next. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so this was just to show you that Tuscumbia is in Colbert County at that time. And where I found D. Suggs living is in Lawrence County. So you can see it's it's situated uh, right next door. So you can see that very, very common pattern, which is why we need to be expanding and looking at those neighboring counties. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. So here I found D. Suggs living in the household of a woman named Sophrona Suggs. Now, instead of saying D, it says DeWitt. And the makeup of the household mm -hmm. suggests a woman with four children. But remember, the 1870 census doesn't give us relationships. Preach. So be very, very careful with assuming very that, right? Careful. I just have to remember that. But yeah. notice there's a mic in the household. Ooh. Yeah. So Mike. now I'm going to make... I'm going to make a hypothesis. My hypothesis mm. is that D and Mike were brothers. Mm. So, so now I'm going to start to test and see if I can get some more supporting information. Next mm. slide. 
and I was fortunate enough to find a Freedmen's Bureau labor contract with Frony Suggs, not Sophrona, but shortened to Frony. Oh. And that labor contract specifies, called her Frony, 32 years old, and her four children, Frank, mm -hmm. 15, Mike, 10, Carrie, 6, and D3. So now I know that they shared a mother. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. wow. Right? So I needed something with a little bit more evidence. Next slide. Now we see that at the end of Dee's life, he had actually gone back to Alabama where he died in 1929. He died in Colbert County. His wife reported that his parents were Obi Golston and Frony, Frony Suggs, Suggs, which we saw in that labor contract, right? Yes. So let's quickly go back to 1880, where you saw that that D was living in the household of Selena Brooks. Do I need to go back? Like no, no, no. Go, it's yeah. the next slide. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, y'all. It's okay. There we go. All yeah. right. So you see D was in that household that's circled in yellow. And one of the things that I noticed is that right next door was an older man named Mike Fenrick. Now, what are the chances of that? Because I'm telling you, uh, Fix was a very, very uncommon name. I circled his household in red. And when I found him in 1870, that census reported he was born where? In Washington, D.C. Oh, so I'm pretty sure okay. I found my Mike's biological father. father. So he and Dee shared a mother, but they had different fathers. Yeah, yeah. I actually have DNA uh, matches with Mike's children with this other wife here named Sarah. Oh. So that's other supporting, in, uh, you know, evidence towards the identification of him as his father. But that DC was critical. No, and, that's yes, that's very critical. Wow. And, and I'm going to show you this and last year too. Yes. He had a very, very large family with three different women, uh, both in and out of slavery. So I've traced all of those children forward and all of their families. Um, you know, the cluster kind of it, it you, you want to make sure that you're doing one and two generations as far as you can into the future. So that's really, really helped me. Sure, sure. Wow, wow. So that wow. so there's no coincidence that he's living right next door. Right next door. And I've always been told, um, like one of the first things that I had I was always told, and I think when I first started, Tony always said this when you're looking at census records, always mm -hmm. look at the neighbors, you look the page forward, the page backwards, you find that to be useful for you as well. Oh, absolutely. 100%. I'm always doing a cluster table. I think I have an image of that. We're going to show you that one. Let's look at yeah. this newspaper article. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Mike Fendricks married a woman named Jane Eliza uh, Sherrill in Tennessee. She was also from Alabama, but I was never able to really uh, prove her identity. Had a lot of problems because the sources all called her different things. Yeah. And until I found this advertisement in an Alabama newspaper in 1912, and that ad named five of Mike uh, uh, and Eliza's children. So I have them circled in yellow. Yes. So I was really shocked to see this. But the ad was for the estate of who? Selena Brooks. Hmm. Where do I know that name? <laughs> D was living with her in 1880, yeah. right? So this is a probate case. We were just talking about that, right? Mm -hmm. With Jim and Michael. And yeah. so, of course, now I had to get the original probate records. And I did. And once I got the original images, which actually had a lot more names than are okay. shown here. So there were 21 heirs listed in the actual probate wow, documents. Wow, 21? 21. They probably just didn't have space for all of that in the paper, right? <laughs> so I spent uh, several weeks researching because now the question is, how are they her heirs? Yeah. And what I discovered is they were all her children and her grandchildren which meant that Mike's wife was Jane Eliza Sherrod, 
and her mother was Selena Sherrod, who later married a Brooke. So that one pulling on the string of D Suggs led me to his father, his mother, you know, identifying yeah. a brother and identifying his wife and his wife's uh, mother. So it was, it was amazing. Yeah. So after you do all that research, you say where we would move on to step five, which is then to use tools and tables to analyze findings. Right. And I would say you're like one of the queens out there, of these tools and these tables. So let's take a look at you. And I love them, too. Um, what you got here and tell us how we can create these at home. This is definitely the engineer in me. So I'm a very visual person. So I have to see information uh, represented differently. And I like to reorganize it depending on what I'm looking for. So I just created this in Microsoft Word. It's a cluster table. I do it all the time. And so what you see is this is 1870. This is in Maryland. And I was looking for potential slaveholders. Uh, potential enslavers of my ancestor. And so all of the uh, whites in the neighborhood who have land um, are highlighted in green. Yeah. And then further down the page, if you go back one, uh, you, you can see that my ancestors are in yellow. Okay. So you can see the proximity. Yeah. Um, so I'm basically researching these individuals nearby. And of course, I was able to finally find the enslaver and she, in fact, was living right in that neighborhood. I think she's a little further up the page. But this is a valuable tool. It's about eight pages long. But I do it so that I can know the neighborhood. You have to know the neighborhood where your ancestor lived. And that 1871 is so critical for, for those of us who are, are researching enslaved people. You got to know you got to know that that neighborhood in 1870. You really, really do. So basically what this is, is a transcription mm -hmm. of the 1870 with your notes and highlights. Yes. Say these are the people that I'm kind of honing in on. Yes. I mean, I tend to put the head of the household. Um, I, I don't really need to know children. So you can see that I've kind of focused on the head yeah. of the household, people with different surnames. Yeah. And I'm thinking through who are the landowners, who's going to school, who's literate, who are the Civil War soldiers, mm -hmm. who are the doctors and merchants that might have manuscripts at local uh, historical societies. So, uh, you know, are, are there women who look like they may have been widowed and I might, might be able to go find a probate file? So those are the, the questions I'm asking myself as I go through the cluster. Okay. Yeah. And so um, how is the person that turned out to be the owner on this actual, sh on one of these sheets? Yes. Let me see. Go to the, let me see if I get the full, the, full, the one that has the full page. Lord, did I wear my right glasses? <laughs> That's okay. You don't have to show us on here. I just wondered if I could just, I just wanted to see what, what, what their name was. What the proximity was. Right. Yeah. It's no, James Williams and Dorothy Williams. They are nearby. Okay. I just can't see it right, right okay. now, but they were still in the neighborhood. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the proximity really worked. Like a lot of people focus on, um, so you found a lot of enslavers. You found more than one, at least, right? Oh, Did yeah. Did you say that proximity trumps surname? I don't know that I would say trumps. Um, I would I say you can. Say that at all, but right. I think so many of us are not going to find the smoking gun of a document, particularly if that enslaver survived the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, but many times you can build a case. You can build a case. And part of that case might be surname, proximity, interaction, so on and so forth. So um, I, I try to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. I just think the uh, slavery was so diverse and, and so different and um, depending on region that it just had a lot of, there's almost no way to to generalize slavery other than to say that it was based on brutality and violence. That's the one constant we know. That is the one constant. And so 
I'd like to like, I rarely ask this, but I would love to get your take on this because I get asked this often. You know, we're researching horrors, like uh, in people who are enslaved, mm. uh, people who, you know, they did not have a good life, whether they mm. were in the, I heard someone say the other day that the owner was a nice owner, like mm. owning people in itself is just, just wrong. Mm -hmm. And so as a researcher, I know, especially when I was researching the Freedmen's Bureau, there were times when I had to get up from the microfilm and go outside and get some air mm. because what you're reading, we're academic about it, but then sometimes that academia kind of slips away and you become a human being reading atrocities about other human beings. Mm -hmm. As a researcher of African-American lineages, how do you deal with that? Mm. So the emotions are so real, the emotions of anger, of sorrow, of grief, I can't even fathom. I have a child, so I think about being sold away, him being sold away. Um, I have uh, a guide, uh, a quote, that uh, I hang up on my wall in my office and it says, slavery's reach is still with us. And part of the gift of doing African-American genealogy is recovering the stories of those caught in its grasp and who could not in their own time leave their own witness. And that is um, my quote. And it is uh, what I keep in mind as I go through these records and the grief. I mean, the least I can do is let myself feel it. They lived it. Right. Exactly. And, and let me just say, it's not just slavery. It's also the hundred years of apartheid after that. I think about a lot, but um, uh, that this mission quote staying here, I do this because I want to give them a voice because their vo voice was snuffed out in their time. And I want to recover it. I want to tell their story. And, say and I want their names. I love yes. it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Robin, this was an amazing quick start. Let us share the steps okay. for using cluster research for ancestry. Step one, hone your research skills. Know what you're doing. Step two, review records for clues. A lot of what we need, we already have. Step three, extract the cluster from the records. Step four, research the cluster. And step five, use tools and tables to analyze your findings. So Robin, uh, did you have any last tips on cluster research, especially you know, as it deals with African-American research? I think it's so important for, um, as what we were talking about in slavery, uh, it's a very valuable tool. It can help on any branch of your family, no matter where they live, but especially during slavery, because the slave community just com just continued after emancipation. And so we know that they are interacting with people that they knew, that they grew up with. But uh, thank you for having me on your show today. It was a real pleasure. Yes, let's make We didn't even talk about how we met. Oh, we met at the PG was no, which was it PG? Central Maryland. It was Central August. Maryland Augs chapter. I came to speak and there was a lady talking about her Confederate something or other there. She had a book. She, was, she was talking about black soldiers who were in white regiments. I yes. think that's what that was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. An explosive topic to say yeah. the least. Yes. Robin, I want to tell them about your book, everyone. Amazon, check out Robin's Reclaiming Kin. Um, I didn't say Amazon. Just check it out. Uh, might be at your library. Um, also, her blog where you can see her latest, um, Reclaiming Kin. Check it out online. Uh, Robin, thank you so much. I'm going to bring Jim back so we can okay. say, oh, wait, let's see. Uh, do we have any questions? We have very little time, but let's see. Judy says, hello. Everyone is very happy. So Robin, thank you. Jim, thank you. Everyone have a fantastic evening. Don't thank you. Robin. You too. I see some of my friends came and showed <laughs>